who was uh, one of you guys was buzzing the ship on a jet ski. I could have sworn it was one of you. <laughs> so, well, nice to see everybody again. Yeah, nice to see you. So All right. Um, well, where to begin tonight? Um, talking to the audience, uh, a lot of folks have been stopping me over the past few days and saying, you know, they seem like just ordinary guys. And I said, no, very nice guys. How have you been able to avoid the trappings of a rock and roll lifestyle, a lifestyle that we've seen, you know, do some strange things to some people and sadly take some away. How have you guys avoided that? The fact is that it's, um, it, we, we were quite fortunate in the respect of the first few years we were together that it wasn't about, um, you know, success in the music okay, business wasn't about celebrity. It was about uh, the, the music okay, then, and bringing the music together. Go back with and, um, right. That was our, our thing, making making records and being together and uh, making okay the music that we wanted to make. It wasn't about um, doing a lot of um, promotion or celebrity kind of stuff. We had our moments in the in the celebrity, the, 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 the Fab 208 magazines, the pop magazines of the 60s, and. Um, but I don't think we even smiled on a photograph until about 1979. <laughs> <laughs> so it was all a bit serious. So we weren't really concerned with that. We were just concerned with making the music. So we avoided that celebrity thing. Whether that's changed anything, whether that answers your question, I don't know. You know, and in, in the US, sadly, we, we have so many, and you're more than likely aware of this, so many celebrities get hounded by the paparazzi as it were. Well, we're not celebrities, are you? Yeah. And also, if you've got kids, they keep you grounded, grounded, because it doesn't matter what you do, you're a dad. Yeah. 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 And, you know, still have to put out the garbage at night, right? Yeah, you've done it. Yeah. Yeah. And on As a diaper to your <laughs> On the flip side of things, the success has and the fame, you know, has enabled you to do a lot of things, things that some ordinary folks might not be able to do. However, what has success prevented you from doing? Starving. <laughs> Open like a tube, you know, right the way through. 
and it's open. And so if you turn around and look at the artwork, and then the bit, well, don't know this stuff takes out the bottom. And then they, they messed around with the uh, staple in it, and I remember trying to, would you try to negotiate some sort of art that was a expert on the Yeah, that's the outside. But I've got that, and that, that artwork is huge. It's like about six, uh, six, you know, six foot and a couple of meters tall. When uh, we re, uh, finished recording uh, Long Distance Voyager, we had everyone come along and try and design a sleeve for us. And uh, everyone tried to copy what we'd done before. All these new artists came along. And we couldn't find it. We were having a photograph session. And in the uh, photography place where we were having the photos, there was this uh, print, uh, which was a thing owned by the uh, Oxford Press. And we looked at it, it was exactly what we needed for long distance Voyager, and that's uh, where the sleeve came from for this photo session. And about six months later, we lost this uh, uh, painting, which was there hanging up. And um, my wife and I were driving through an antique area, and we saw some paintings, went in, and there was the long distance Voyager on her. Oh. And um, the um, I said, where did you get this from? I said, well, we cleared it out from an old building which used to be a photograph. Uh, and then it was. I said, well, it's not very nice. Is it? <laughs> Dollar. <laughs> and uh, I must tell you, it's uh, hanging up in this flat. In, 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 Check behind the frame, see if anybody hit money or anything. <laughs> what happens? Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so you're an artist yourself. Well, not really. Uh, <laughs> you dabble? No, I do dabble. I, I really do enjoy it. And uh, yeah, if I had more time, I think I would do uh, a lot more things. You know, so. Uh, but it's time, you know. You get the guitar out every day and you play. And you, Perhaps I'll do some painting. No, I'll play my guitar. Do you have enough pieces that if somebody were to say, we'd like to exhibit it, you'd be open to that? Um, I, I, I'm really more into photography. Uh, I don't mind like taking photographs. Um, uh, I really do, uh, yesterday, when we were in uh, Ocho Rios, uh, we wandered off and uh, you know, the tourist guy wanted to take us everywhere. <laughs> Up the Fern Valley. It looks a bit like Cobham in the summer. And, uh, uh, that's where we live, of course. And, uh, but we all sort of wandered up all this hill for 20 minutes, and we got to the top. It was like Jack and Jill. We came back down again. <laughs> I couldn't see the point of that. But there you go. And all he wanted to do was tell me about uh, all the drainage works that they do. <laughs> Uh, but we did go to a uh, jerk chicken, uh, yeah. the and they were really cooking on the on the sweet wood, and they had the corrugated corrugated iron over the top. It was all smoking away and cooking away. But what was wonderful, they had these wonderful flowers in the garden. So I was fortunate to take my camera with me, and I'd click it and click it and click it. And uh, no, so uh, that may that may appear one day. Yes. Yeah. Okay. You, uh, a friend of uh, yours, uh, Graham Nash, is a photographer and always takes his camera wherever he goes. Every time he comes into the studio in New York, there's a camera around his neck. He's never taken a picture of me interviewing him, which would be a nice little keepsake. But do you travel with, wherever you go? Do you always have a camera at the ready? Right? Yeah, I have a camera all while and a little movie camera, a little flip. If anybody's got one, then really, it's a little flip camera. It's really instant, you know, you capture something immediately there, go, now I've got to check the aperture, I've got to do this, I've got to do that, oh, I've got to charge it up. <laughs> <laughs> on, the, uh, on the deck on Thursday, we, we talked about music and uh, some of the songs, the albums and stuff. Yeah, please. Going back, it's good. It's and if good stuff. some of them have taken on different meanings for you over time, 
to which you will answer. Are there any songs that you would like to go back and change lyrically, musically, sonically? There's one that's uh, always stuck with me. Uh, and that was a song called Love and Beauty. Uh, uh, done, uh, we like to say, mostly by Mike. Uh, and there was a section in that where it, there had to be a really terrific boom. And we, I tried everything. I had beat the bass drum at this far away and I was hitting and stabbing up anything. And I just not, could not get that really huge thud. So I'd, because uh, only that's all I had to do. <laughs> <laughs> I think the ribbon marks in those days would have broken for that one, yeah. And Justin, last night you mentioned when, uh, hearing, yes, when hearing the Moody Blues on the radio, and sometimes to you it doesn't sound as loud as the music that precedes and follows. Yeah, that's a curious thing that you hear on the radio. Yeah, you, you, you instinctively want to kind of turn it up, because it just seems um, that... that I, I, yeah, that's, uh, that's it, you answered. Yeah. I just, in retrospect, would you go back and remix them to make them loud? Is what I'm no, curious. because they're all done to the same standard. And also, you know very well that um, most radio stations now nowadays compress things so that they are all actually, everything is at the same uh, uh, volume on, on a radio station. It just appears like that, you know, if, you, if you've made a record. Yeah. That's all. Yeah. I'm not being honest, but you know, just sort that out. Yeah. Right. <laughs> this, this, this question always <laughs> This next uh, little item always gets an, an interesting answer, and it might not be something you, you could answer right here, or maybe at the end of the session, something may come to you. A song you wish you had written. Any one of you. Uh, maybe green sleeves, I wouldn't mind at all. 400 years, that's not bad. I'll write some new lyrics for it then, yeah. yeah. Anything come to mind for you, John or Justin? We may come back to that in a while. Okay. <laughs> Curious. Sometimes it evokes some interesting answers out of people. So. Yeah. The Beatles, when they recorded The Long and Winding Road, oh, okay. did not include the strings and everything. As we know, Phil Spector went back and added that on later. Okay. Paul McCartney has gone on record as saying that he does like the original version better. However, in concert, if you go to see him, he performs it full on with, you know, the strings all through the keyboards, obviously, the, the version that we all know. Knights in White Satin, if the single version was without strings, if I'm not mistaken, correct? Well, actually, this on the single version of, of, of Knights, uh, that's, it, 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 the, 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 the sound that, you, that appears to be strings is just Mellotron, it's Mike's uh, Mellotron. So they, even on the album version, Peter Knight only came in about halfway through the last verse, which led to the um, that segue out to the, to the second half of uh, Graham's poem. So um, we, we never recorded with the uh, with Peter and the London Festival Orchestra uh, at all during that album. We we recorded ours in about three, three days or something in the week, and then. Um, Peter and uh, Tony Clark and Derek Reynolds and Peter made the, put ours in, in complete sequence, all of our songs for Days of Future Past. And this is how primitive this was, because they were bouncing from four track to four track. So they left gaps with Peter on one of the tracks of the four that they bounced to, counting his way through. So when they did a rehearsal, they, did, they came in at 10 o'clock on Saturday morning with the orchestra. The, 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 uh, Gypsies, the you know, the, the, um, the, the fathers, and then um, they did one rehearsal, and Peter listening to this count, 
and then they did one take, and that's the take that's uh, wow. that's on the, on the album. Wow. And, uh, the interesting, the part of the interesting thing is that I was in the studio when I turned up for that. These were the days when we were never actually allowed into the control room, but you could be in the studio. <laughs> They were invited into the control room and then they say, well, come and have a listen. And that's the only time we got to go in. But in, on the, um, when Larry Baird did his version of the same of Peter Mike Stark, because I went to Babs night after Peter had died to see if she still had those parts, and she didn't. She didn't have them. She didn't. Peter would have hidden them. Yeah, he wrote so much. Mm -hmm. But um, so Larry Baird had to start all over again. And so he did his copy of Peter Knight's version of all of that with Graham's poem. And then he said to Larry Baird said to me one day, he said, I've never figured out while well, there was this big sort of crash on the tree bell at, at the right at the end of it. And I said, Ah, no, I can tell you what that is. Because there was only one take. And it wasn't written in there, but I was sitting on there was a step in the in Death in the where we climb up. You could have a good view of all the uh, all gypsies from there. And so, towards the end of the album, when they were getting to this one tape, this is really important, it's 47 pieces of music, minutes of music, the studio cat came in from the other door <laughs> and, and ran across the studio and knocked over the tree bar. <laughs> they were just about to get to their big bit with the gong and everything. So, People looking at each other and it's just like a sleep. Um, so that's, that crash stayed on the record and, and, and uh, I never thought that much more about it. We all knew it was there when we got to it, but I, I, I'd just forgotten about it until Larry there, 25 years later, said, Well, why the hell did Peter put that? It came out of the door and straight out of the door. Did the cat get royalties? Oh, <laughs> it never went nice because that, that studio was so was oh, nice and nice yeah. and whatever. Mm -hmm. It was like we used to say it was like the engine room of a Belgian trawler. Battleship yeah. <laughs> <laughs> grey. It was interesting times because um, as artists or musicians, we weren't allowed to go to the control room as just to say. We weren't allowed to go into the restaurant to eat with everyone else. We were just there as like, oh, they're musicians, they don't belong here at all. <laughs> and everyone walked around in white coats. And everyone had white technical coats on, strange times. Yeah, the engineers had white coats and the assistant engineers had brown coats. And there was also, it was like school really, because they had a fantastic staff there. Mm -hmm. And one day, the, the whole staff, the, the Mr. Haddy, who was in charge of the studio, he was a classical engineer himself, but he'd risen up through the ranks, and he was in charge of this great big building in West Hampton. that was the old West Hampton Town Hall, with three studios, one giant, the, the number three studio, which was the biggest in London. And um, he was, Mr. Haddy was having a little thing with his secretary for years. <laughs> and he'd say things, and he had a little intercom system, and he'd say, you know, like, put in the new mischievous And everybody knew about it, all the kids who went into the studio. So one day they, they wired up Mr. Haddy's intercom to his secretary to the whole world. <laughs> 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 so I think you should come in and take another note or something like that. <laughs> Because most people left at 6 o'clock at night, and that's usually when we started. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when we started. We used to uh, come out of the studio at 6 o'clock in the morning, and then we were... We were just online, we were in that... We were in that... We were just over in this Mercedes car, we were coming back from the studio, and we go going through a part of London called Shepherd's Bush, and it was 6 o'clock in the morning, and we were in the Mercedes, and, some, and uh, roadies driving it. And we pull up at this bus stop, and this woman said to her, son, there you are, son, that's how you become successful. You have to be up early in the morning to get to work. <laughs> you 
uh, you mentioned last night about how uh, I think it was uh, the Decca Studios just up the road from Abbey Road and yeah. stuff. Yeah. And we've always heard all these stories about how, uh, you know, one of the stories was how uh, the Beatles and some of the Stones, they were all at the Bag of Nails the night that Jimi Hendrix yeah. made his debut. And I think that was the Scottish and Jones, actually, wasn't it? Yeah, Scottish yeah. and Jags. Okay. Yeah. yeah we're, we're just, you know, we're so enamored, as we mentioned, with the British music and that whole in invasion that came over. And I think a lot of us just uh, picture it as just a small little knit community, close knit community. Was there a lot of hanging out with yeah. other bands? Oh yeah. There was uh, through the years. There was uh, the Scottish and Jones, the Back and Isles, also Yeah, it's pretty <laughs> And also there's a, a greasy spoon restaurant called the Blue Boar, where you all used to meet, you know, you drawing from all over England, going back to London, and that was on the, um, the, the good road, and you'd all meet in there, and, uh, yeah, and you remember the guy with the thing hanging off his ears used to do the beans up for you. <laughs> and you, you, you uh, we never understood, if you wanted to be a successful uh, music writer, you should have just set up shop there because everybody went through yeah. there. Yeah, we met those people there. Yeah. Yeah. So, right, because we all got home at um, you know three or four o'clock, then we, we the clubs or at say two o'clock, the clubs would still be open. The Maganels would still be open. So oh yeah, we'd meet people there. And, and also it was, it was great fun because although they'd be serving drinks till four o'clock, they'd um, the, the local DJ or the, if there was a band on the band would knock off at two and we all used to get up and jam and I remember I was there at one time, I was on drums, uh, Jack Bruce from Cream was on uh, lead guitar, Eric Clapton was playing lead guitar, bass guitar, uh, Eric Clapton was playing lead guitar and Chas Chandler from the Animals, remember him? He came up with this American black guy who played his guitar upside down. And I played behind Eric Clapton and Jimmy Hendrix. Oh. And that's the matter. There was no cell phones, there was no way to start recording it out in existence, and I love it. It was. And that was fun. Was there, even in the, in the uh, did the sound guy run any tape on that? Is there any recordings of it anywhere? Uh, we'd only just got past putting it on a little wax cylinder. There was no portable tapes. I thought maybe the engineers from Abbey Road hung out there too or something, wired something up. Oh wow, that's, that's, I wish. that's something. Justin and John, any memorable late night jam sessions like that for you guys? You know, I, th I think that there were, um, but um, it was it was nothing unusual or exceptional. I think it was, like you said before, it was quite a small community of boys and girls in the in that part of the sixties, and that you kind of all knew each other. You went to each other's flats and played records and got stoned and stuff. But it was a nice. <laughs> group of it wasn't like sitting at a motion television kind of thing like that. Yeah. But it was it was a small group of people in in London. We were very fortunate to be uh, to be part of that. Really, it was uh, absolutely brilliant. Yeah, it was a great, looking back, of course, it was a great time. But I don't think people thought that it was a, a big deal really at the time. I mean. Um, I went to, uh, I went to, uh, looking, it's only now that you think back, oh, that's amazing. But I went to Donovan's house. Oh, yeah. and, uh, and I went to his house um, uh, in Virginia Water, and George was there. And uh, George was always a good friend of Donovan's as well. George Harris? Yeah. And we, and we, we sat down, and um, Donovan also had some lovely guitars, and he, and he knew I liked one particular one that he with these silver steel strings on. And so he, he got me playing it, and the three of us are just sitting around playing. And um, then, what, what was it? We, we started actually doing, so we, we got round to doing some Beatles songs. And, <laughs> and, and Donovan said, I was really like that, um, uh, I'm only sleeping. So, when you wake up early in the morning, stay in bed. And uh, so Don Donovan started that, and Josh, I, I don't know the cause to that. And we just carried on. Very nice, very 
very sweet people. Or uh, everybody on the scene. I can't remember any um, idiots. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe they were, but I, I don't. I didn't cross that one. Uh, you I, choose your company well. You know. yeah. I had uh, an experience with my son. I told you earlier, you know, celebrity for your son, right? Uh, my son, many years later, was probably about. He was in uh, uh, high school. So he was about 16. And he was a big. Lenny Kravitz fan, loved him, and he read this um, article of, from Lenny Kravitz saying how much he admired Jimi Hendrix, and uh, so he went out and bought a Jimi Hendrix album, and uh, he was playing it upstairs and I think, and he came running downstairs, and bear in mind this lad is singing at Madison Square Gardens, he's singing at the Albert Hall, he's singing, you know, Gold this up on the wall didn't mean a thing to him. He <laughs> <laughs> came running down the stairs and he got a copy of Jimmy Hendrix's Electric Lady Land. And he goes, You've got to listen to this guy. This <laughs> and I said, Oh, I was the first person outside the studio to hear that. I was living just around the corner and Jimmy came around when he finished it with a, a quarter inch reel to reel first fix of the album. And he knocked me up at about half past one in the morning and played it to me. Because he knew, I, I, he, well, anyway, he knew he could have a, a cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> and my son looked at me and said, You knew Jimmy. <laughs> Thank you.